congratulations on surviving your first unit of AP Chemistry. There were tears, there was blood, but it will be okay because we're moving on now. This is a new unit, and this should go much better because it will go much slower. Uh, unit 2, Types of Chemical Reactions, which is what we'll focus on in our second half of the unit, and Solution Stoichiometry, which is what we'll focus on now. And it should be mostly review for most of you. As most solutions uh, that we'll talk about in chemistry are aqueous, meaning they happen in water, it would be best if we review a little bit about water. Water is all known as the common solvent because it is so e so readily used and it dissolves a lot of things. And this has to do with some unique structures that water has. First off, water has a very high specific heat, meaning it can absorb a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to raise water just one degree Celsius. And because it has a high specific heat, it stays a liquid longer than most other substances of a similar molecular mass. Therefore, it has a high heat of vaporization. It takes a lot of energy to vaporize water. This high heat of vaporization and high specific heat deal with the type of bond between oxygen and hydrogen. It is a polar covalent bond where oxygen has six valence electrons. Let me go ahead and throw those on there. And hydrogen, each hydrogen has one valence electron. So they get together and they share their valence electrons in a covalent bond. Sharing electrons is covalent. Now, oxygen has a very high electronegativity, meaning le oxygen does not share electrons very well, and in fact, it's going to rip these electrons towards itself, leaving it high more or less naked out there, all by itself. Oh, you a poor naked little proton. Yes, you are. Hydrogen loses its electrons, more or less. They are still sharing, it is still a covalent bond, but this oxygen now is hoarding the electrons, and it doesn't give uh, hydrogen even a second thought. This causes hydrogen to have a partial positive charge. Each hydrogen develops a partially positive charge, and we symbolize this with the lowercase delta. The oxygen, since it has stolen or is hoarding two extra electrons, has a partial negative charge, so a partial two negative. And it's these partial charges that give it its polarity. Hydrogen and oxygen also are capable of forming hydrogen bonds, which are partial bonds between hydrogen and other oxygens. Since this is more or less a naked proton, it's very attracted to this partially negative charge, and it will attract to them. Uh, hydrogen has this ability to do this with oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Pretty much the way I remember them is NOF. Anytime you see hydrogen and uh, NOF, you end up with a hydrogen bond. And these hydrogen bonds give water the ability to be cohesive and adhesive. Cohesive meaning it sticks together. It's the reason that water flows from one place to the next. And adhesive is the reason water is wet. It sticks to you. Now, most molecules that have the ability to have up to four bonds, and oxygen, believe it or not, can have up to four bonds, have a tetrahedral shape, meaning the bond angle between them and their outermost uh, bond is 100 nine degrees. However, this lone pair off to the side here hogs up a lot of space and actually pushes this bond angle smaller. Anytime you have lone pairs, the bond angles decrease. When we talk about bonding and geometries and hybridization, this will become more and more and more and more and more important and you'll know more and more and more and more about it. But for right now, just know that the bond angle between hydrogen and oxygen is significantly less. It's 105 degrees rather than 109. Since hydrogen and oxygen have these partial charges, it allows them to dissolve many things by surrounding them in a process called hydration. The positive ends of water, the hydrogens, get attracted to the anions of, say, a ionic bond. And if the attraction between them is greater than the attraction between the anion and the cation, the water can surround the anion and pull it off of the lattice. At the same time, the cation can attract the negative side, the oxygen in water, which can also surround it and pull it all out of the lattice. This is a process called solubility, when the attraction is greater than the lattice structure's attraction for the compound. And when this happens, dissolving occurs. The easiest way to know whether or not something dissolves or not is simply remember the phrase, like dissolves like. Water, a polar compound, can dissolve polar compounds in ionics. Whereas
whereas nonpolar substances such as acetone can dissolve nonpolar substances like, say, styrofoam. Now, for a little more vocabulary as we move into this world of solutions and aqueous. A solution is a homogeneous mixture, meaning there's an equal distribution of particles throughout uh, the mixture. It's a homogeneous mix mixture where the solute, being the thing that's in less concentration, is dissolved in the solvent, the thing that is in more concentration. Solute has less letters, it's in less concentration. Solvent, two more letters, technically one more letter, is in more concentration. And we reserve the word aqueous for any solution where water is the solvent. And as I said, a lot of, re a lot of reactions will occur in aqueous in here. Now when something dissolves, there are a couple ways we can describe it. We can describe it as either it's an electrolyte or a non-electrolyte. Now, electrolyte you've heard from when you talk about Gatorade. Yes, Gatorade has electrolytes in it. Electrolytes conduct electricity. And the way that this happens is when you drop something into solution, if it's an electrolyte, it dissolves and becomes ions in solution. Since those ions are free floating, you can, develop, you can pass a charge from positive to negative, positive to negative, all the way across whatever the median is. Water itself does not conduct electricity. It's the ions and electrolytes in water that conduct electricity. Now, if something is a strong electrolyte, that means it dissolves completely or dissociates completely. And you're going to need to know the solubility rules, which I'll give you uh, in much greater detail next class. Strong acids, strong bases, and any soluble salt will be a strong electrolyte, meaning it dissolves completely in solution. It gives us a one, it gives us the correct ratio of cation to anion. On the other hand, a weak electrolyte does not dissociate completely, and therefore only about 1% of it dissociates, and it will only pass a, a current somewhat. Uh, a light bulb, if you try to light a light bulb in it, will only light up dimly. So examples of this are acetic acid or ammonia, where only a handful of hydrogen ion atoms are actually capable of leaving acetic acid, and the rest of the acetic ions can, every now and then will drop one off. However, it's a weak acid, and therefore it will not pass a current too well. It's a weak electrolyte, does not dissociate completely. On the, and then if something that doesn't dissociate at all is a non-electrolyte, meaning it is totally incapable of passing a current through it. So now we come to the stoichiometry part of solutions, knowing their molarity. And I introduced this at the end of the unit last time. Molarity is the concentration. It's how much you have in a set space. And in chemistry, we don't talk about stuff in terms of students or uh, this one thing. We're talking about stuff. When we say stuff, we mean moles. So how much moles you have in a set space, space in chemistry, again, would be liters. So this is moles per liter would be molarity. And not only just moles of anything, it's the moles of solute. So moles of whatever you're dissolving per liter of solution. Molarity is the concentration of moles per liter of solution. And we symbolize this with square brackets. So if I was going to talk about the concentration of chlorine, I could just as easily put up the symbol like that where I'm talking about the number of moles of chlorine ions in a solution. So now that you know molarity, you, know, you can now know how to make your own solutions. To make your own solutions, you take the mass of whatever it is you're trying to make a solute, and you figure out how many moles you need. You place that, many, that mass into the bottom of a volumetric flask, dissolve it, with enough water, and then you fill the volumetric flask up to the line. If you don't dissolve it first, you're negating how what the volume is of that solid. Lastly, last bit of definition, a standard solution is a solution whose concentration is, is absolutely known. And we will be working with this in our next lab, standardized solutions.
So the easiest way to learn this is simply do it. And we're asked to calculate the molarity of a solution prepared by dissolving 11.5 grams of solid sodium hydroxide in enough water to make a 1.5 liter solution. So again, I always start by highlighting what I'm given and what I'm trying to get. So I'm given 11.5 grams of, sodium, of solid sodium hydroxide, 1.5 liter solution is what I'm trying to make, and I want to know what the molarity is of that solution. So once again, we're given grams. We can do very little in chemistry with grams, so we've got to convert that to moles. So 11.5 grams of sodium hydroxide is how many moles of sodium hydroxide. So we're going to go ahead and divide by the molar mass, which we find on our periodic table to be 40. And when we divide that out, we end up finding out that we have 0.192 moles of sodium hydroxide. But wait, that's not what we were asked to find. We want to know the molarity of the solution, so we're going to take our moles and divide by how many liters we've got. We've got 1.5 liters, so let's plug that in. And when we divide all this out, we find out that we have a 0.192 molar solution of sodium hydroxide. And yes, there was some editing magic in there. So if you're confused, don't be. This is correct. Now, when I order chemicals for your lab, they don't come to me in the concentration I ask for. I can't say, hey, Fisher, send me a 0 0.5 molar sulfuric acid. I need to say, send me sulfuric acid. And they send me this highly concentrated form. It's 18 molar when it's shipped to me. <clears throat> which is not very practical. I can't give you 18 molar sulfuric acid. You would kill one another. So I need to dilute it to decrease the concentration. And I do this by increasing the volume. I keep the number of moles the same. I'm just changing the volume of the end product. So uh, to figure out how much of the concentrate I need in order to find the molarity, in order to create a molarity that I'm looking for, we use the formula MV equals MV, where the molarity of the concentrate times the volume of the concentrate will equal the molarity of my diluted or di desired molarity times the volume of the overall solution I'm trying to make. So let's look at these. What if I asked you what volume of 16 molar sulfuric acid must be used to prepare 1.5 liters of a 0.1 molar sulfuric acid solution? Well, start it the same way we always do. Let's highlight what we're given and what we're asked to find. We're asked to find the volume of this molarity. We've got another volume and another molarity. I see two volumes, two molarities. Uh, MV equals MV. Ta-da! All right, now we just got to figure out what goes with what. First off, the higher concentration is always going to go with a small volume. This doesn't take a lot. We've got to take just a teeny bit of this, and we're going to dilute it to something bigger. So the higher concentration goes with a low volume. The high volume goes with a low concentration. So let's plug in some numbers. And I'm being extremely redundant here and in including sulfuric acid in all of my units. Let's just let you see. It's the same thing. Our number of moles is going to stay the same. So if we multiply this and divide by 16, we should figure out how many liters, because our volumes are in liters, we're going to need. If our volume was in milliliters, we could give an answer in milliliters. It wouldn't matter. So let's do that. 1.0.1 times 1.5 divided by 16 is really freaking small. But it's in liters. That's small, but we can manipulate it into something we use more normally around here. Uh -huh. Milliliters. So let's take this, divide by, multiply by a thousand. Voila. We would need 9.375 milliliters of our concentrated acid, and we're going to take that and we're going to put it into a volumetric flask, 1.5 liter volumetric flask, and we're going to fill it up to the brim, and not to the brim, to the line, and that will give us a 0.1 molar solution of sulfuric acid. If you're having trouble visualizing it, here's the visual. We fill up a measuring pipette to 9.375, because it measures in milliliters, drop that into a volumetric flask, and then we're going to fill the rest of it with distilled water up to the line. Again, this should be 1.5 milliliters, not 500, but 
That's what happens when you steal from a book. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is dilutions molarity.